My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. In 2009, a psychological horror film was released that changed this horror genre forever. The movie called The Orphan tells the tale of a couple whose marriage became strained after the stillbirth of their third child. This loss was very hard on the family, and as a way to move forward, the couple decided to adopt a nine-year-old Russian girl named Esther from a local orphanage. The couple's oldest son, Daniel, resents the family's new addition, while their five-year-old daughter, Max, embraces having a new sister. This is where things start to get strange. Esther starts exhibiting hostile behavior towards animals and schoolmates, and she seems to have knowledge of someone older than her. When Sister Abigail from the orphanage decides to come to the house to check in on Esther, this is when the couple finds out that tragic events and incidents always occur around her. One of these was the deaths of Esther's previous adoptive parents. After a whole bunch of bad happens, the family learns that Esther is not a nine-year-old girl after all, but actually is a 33-year-old woman who suffers from proportional dwarfism. She spent her life posing as a child, and she's actually a violent serial killer who has murdered at least seven people. Now, I'm not going to ruin this movie for those who did not see it, but this one is a definite must-see. The plot was very different for its time, but what most people don't know is that this terrifying tale is actually based on a true story. So get comfortable, my spooky friends. You're about to hear the real story behind the horror film, The Orphan. But before we get started, just a little heads up. In this episode, we will be speaking about child abuse, cannibalism, and sexual abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Identity theft is a complex yet common crime. It is done in many different ways, including stealing bank account information, credit card information, or mail that contains sensitive information. Most of the motivations for identity theft seem to center around three things, financial gain, revenge, or to hide another crime. In the stories that you're about to hear, I'm not so sure that these apply. The tale behind the movie The Orphan begins with two women from the Czech Republic named Clara and Katrina Morova. Both in their early 30s, the two loved to talk about how they were destined to fulfill a mission in life for God. Clara became a single mother after the father of her two boys, Andre, age 8, and Jacob, age 9, left the family due to Clara's strange behaviors and beliefs. Even so, everyone who knew them did not have any suspicions that anything was wrong behind closed doors. Clara seemed to be a very good mother who took exceptional care of her boys, but all of that changed one day when she met a child named Annika. One day, Katrina went to visit her sister and nephews, and she brought with her a 13-year-old orphan from Norway. Katrina said that she was looking after her since she discovered Annika was on the run from a sex trafficking gang from there. Now, during the visit, Annika told the women how she was severely sexually and physically abused by the gang members. The young girl gained Clara's sympathy after she started to tell her about her many physical illnesses, such as leukemia, kidney failure, and she was going both blind and deaf. Clara's heart broke as she heard this girl's story and she wanted to help. After the events you're about to hear about, Clara has been described by those who knew her as gullible and easily manipulated. That is why she did not ask any questions as she immediately accepted Annika into her family and cared for her like she was her own child. She didn't even bat an eye when Katrina refused to let Clara take Annika to any doctor's appointments and would only let them communicate on the phone. Now, she also didn't get concerned when she started to get strange text messages and emails from a mysterious doctor who claimed he knew exactly how to treat Annika's illnesses. He asked to meet with Clara to discuss this and scheduled the meeting inside a parked car at midnight. Even though Clara could not see the person's face clearly, she had no fear since this man had all of Annika's medical records. 
He showed her what looked like a diplomatic passport and asked if he could now be Annika's new and only doctor. Clara agreed. Right after this meeting, Clara started receiving more texts and emails from this mysterious doctor. In these, he would detail his treatment plans. Now, my dear listeners, I worked in many different healthcare settings and have seen many different treatment plans. I have never heard of one like this. Apparently, Clara had to rub Annika all over her body for hours, concentrating on her groin. He claimed that this would help by making Annika, and I quote, very happy. Now that Clara was spending her time caring for Annika, she started spending less and less time with her sons. By the time that Clara started to think about adopting the girl, the boys were mostly cared for by their grandparents. When Clara mentioned to the doctor that she was thinking of starting up adoption proceedings, the doctor was against it. He said that it would be impossible since it was clear that Clara cared more about her sons than Annika. When Clara asked the doctor what could she do to make this adoption go through, the doctor suggested that she had to, and I quote, cure the boy's evil spirits. Now, the only way to do this, according to the doctor, was through tough love, which included very hard discipline and physical punishments. This is when Clara started to look for any reason to hurt her sons. She would beat them for anything she could think of with her bare hands, wooden spoons, and belts. She also started to lock them up alone in small rooms, leaving them there overnight. But that wasn't enough, according to Annika's doctor. In August of 2006, he told Clara that these punishments were just not good enough, and she had to take the further step of stop acting like their mother in any way. Now, this would help her take away her guilt for what would happen next. She was told to take the children away to a small cottage that was out in the woods not near anyone else. At this cottage, Clara met up with her brother and two other women who she knew from the summer camp that she took her boys to previously. It was here that the torture began for Clara's sons. For the next eight days, all these boys knew was pain and terror. They were kept locked inside of dog cages and were treated like animals. Now, these cages were so small that the boys couldn't stand or barely move in any way. They were forced to eat inside those cages out of dog bowls and were forced to relieve themselves inside. The cages were never cleaned and the children were forbidden to speak. Clara would submerge their heads into water to the point of almost drowning with their arms held behind their backs so they couldn't fight back. They were burned by cigarettes, poked and scratched by eating utensils, sexually abused, forced to physically fight each other, and then beaten before they would be thrown back into those same cages with their arms and legs tied behind their backs. And that was just Clara. The others joined in with the beatings and burnings on their own, and they would tie bags onto the boys' heads so they could not see what was coming. And then it got worse. The group started to cut flesh off one of the boys' buttocks. They forced this boy to eat his own flesh before they started cutting off skin from other areas as well so they could eat it too. In the middle of this hell, the group would mentally torture the young boys. Annika told the adults to pretend to abuse her as well so the boys would not think that they were being targeted. Annika also told the adults that through all of this, the young boys were still being mean to her, which resulted in them upping their abuse. You see, Annika started to claim previous to this that the boys were bullying her. During the boys' torture, Annika claimed that the boys were still mean to her because they knew if they continued bullying her that they would get hurt. So the adults believed this and tortured the young boys even more. The following month, Clara decided to adopt Annika again. This time, the doctor claimed that nothing was standing in her way. Clara decided to give her two sons to Katrina so she can concentrate 100% on Annika. After all, she believed that Annika's physical and mental health issues were so bad that it wasn't possible for her to care for three kids at the same time. But by January of 2007, Katrina decided to move her and the boys in with Clara. This is when the abuse came back full force. The boys received the same torture they did before, except this time they were kept in their home's dank cellar where Clara had the opportunity to video record what was happening. They were locked in this prison for about a year while Annika had her own bedroom upstairs. 
Annika's room was colorful and filled with toys, and she enjoyed every second she was there knowing that her adopted brothers were being tortured in the basement. And then came the miracle that these boys direly needed. A neighbor named Edward was setting up a CCTV-based baby monitor for his newborn son. For those who have never used a baby monitor, sometimes these devices can pick up audios or visuals that you wouldn't expect when someone nearby is running a video or audio feed on the same channel. And that is exactly what happened in September of 2006. When Edward looked onto the monitor to check his infant son, he saw the image of a naked young boy. The boy had his arms and legs tied behind his back, and he did not look healthy at all. He was filthy, and he was trying to eat something that was thrown on the floor. Every few moments, Edward could see a woman's hand tossing food to the boy. Now, as you guys can imagine, Edward went into an immediate panic. He called the police and told them what he was seeing, and he begged them to save the child he was watching. The police immediately started going door to door in the neighborhood to try to track down where the camera feed was coming from, and it didn't take them long to find Clara's son locked in her dungeon. The police arrested Clara and Katrina and took the boys and Annika to a group home. Shortly after arriving, Annika ran away. It was a short time afterwards that the true horror of all of this was revealed. There was no Annika after all. Annika was really a 33-year-old woman named Barbara Sklarova, who had a glandular disease that made it very easy for her to pretend to be a 13-year-old girl. She used this to her advantage to avoid having charges filed against her as she regularly broke the law. After running away from the Czech Republic, Barbara ran to Norway, which was the place she claimed she was sex trafficked by local gangs. When she was there, she got liposuction and a breast reduction to look even younger. She bound her breasts, shaved her head, and then started to present herself as a 13-year-old boy named Adam. She made her way to an orphanage in Oslo, and from there, she convinced a couple to adopt her. This couple was able to get her a Czech passport, and using this, she was enrolled into school. When there, Barbara was able to fool her teachers, staff, and the local police for months before they started to suspect that Adam was not who he seemed to be. When Barbara started to suspect that the jig was up, Adam made claims that he was being brutally abused by his adopted father, which resulted in him being placed in an emergency youth center. Now, it was from there that Adam ran away, and missing posters were put up everywhere in hopes to find the child. And when they did, they were stunned to realize that Adam was actually a 33-year-old woman who was able to convince Clara to torture her children. But this isn't the biggest plot twist in this tale, my spooky friends. I'm about to drop another bomb on you. Do you remember how I told you that Clara and Katrina brought other people to their torture cabin to hurt the boys under Annika's direction? All of those people who participated were directly connected to a man named Joseph, who just happened to be the leader of a fundamentalist cult that they were all part of. The cult was operated by the man that we've been calling the doctor, and the doctor was actually Barbara's biological father. Now, Katrina, she was actually aware of all this, and she was also aware of Barbara's real identity. Yes, my spooky friends, you heard that correctly. Allegedly, Katrina knew who Annika really was all along since she was part of the doctor's cult. She knew how easy it would be to manipulate her sister, so she played along with Barbara's evil games. All the text messages and emails sent to Clara came from Katrina and Barbara's devices. So why did Barbara do all of this? Well, in court, she claimed that she did this to escape the reality of her own life. She further claimed that Katrina and Clara abused her as well, but the court found that really hard to believe since everything she said was lies. Barbara was sentenced to five years in prison while Clara was sentenced to nine. Katrina received a sentence of 10 years in jail, but today they're all free. 
Katrina and Clara served their full sentences, while Barbara got out of prison early after her lawyer successfully argued that her mental well-being had suffered in prison. I know, my spooky friends, hearing that upset me too, since Barbara clearly did not care about the mental well-being of the children involved in this story. But what upsets me even more is the fact that this very intelligent chameleon was released back into the public and no one knows where she is today. She has proven that she can cross borders, manipulate people into getting her official documents, became embedded into families, and has caused chaos. But she's not the only one who has done something this horrible and is walking around free today. Nicholas Barclay was a 13-year-old boy from Texas in the United States who disappeared in 1994. He went missing after playing basketball with his friends, and it was quickly believed that he had been kidnapped and possibly killed. There was no closure for Nicholas's family since no body was ever discovered. So imagine how they felt when they received a call from Spanish authorities who claimed they located their son. He was allegedly in Europe and was now waiting to come home. But when Nicholas's family saw him for the first time, they didn't act confused when maybe they should have been. Their naturally blonde, blue-eyed son who had a Texan accent now appeared to have bleach blonde hair, brown eyes, and a French accent. Eventually, it was discovered that Nicholas was actually a man named Frederick Borda. It is not known for sure when Frederick started to become a serial imposter, but in interviews he claimed he was only looking for the love and affection that he said he never received as a child. That is why, in part, he says he was driven to impersonate children. It is believed that he stole the identities of more than 40 different individuals, and most of these were the identities of missing teenagers. Experts say that Frederick may be one of the world's worst perpetrators of child identity theft. Frederick Borda was born on June 13, 1974, in Nanterre, France, and it is said that his early years were filled with abuse. His mother was only a teen when she became pregnant by Frederick's father, who was Algerian. His grandfather was massively racist, and because of this, he begged his daughter to have an abortion. She refused, and according to this, Frederick has publicly stated the following, and I quote, Before I was born, I already had the wrong identity. One of the earliest discovered identity thefts that Frederick did was when he pretended to be a 16-year-old orphan named Jimmy. He claimed that he was from the United States, but had been in a car accident and lost his memory. A Catholic children's home took the man in, and he lived there for several months before he discovered he was a fraud. In another incident, Frederick claimed to be a boy named Francisco Hernandez Fernandez, who disappeared in Spain in 1994. Francisco's family took Frederick in thinking that he could be their missing son, but Frederick's lives were exposed when the real Francisco was found alive. Frederick then moved on to impersonate another missing boy named Brian Smart. Brian was also from the United States, and he went missing in 1995. When Frederick claimed that he was Brian, he told the tale that he was kidnapped and sexually abused by a group of men. He was able to convince a Spanish family of his story, and they took him in. But that didn't last long, since the police discovered who Frederick really was and had him deported back to France. Now concerning Nicholas Barclay, he was living in San Antonio, Texas when he disappeared. Nicholas's mother worked night shift and often slept during the day. That is why Nicholas called his brother Jason to ask him to wake up their mom so she could come pick him up from where he was playing basketball. Jason told Nicholas that he was not going to wake their mom up since he was playing basketball in an area that wasn't far away. He told Nicholas that he could walk home. Nicholas agreed, but he never made it home. He hasn't been seen since that day. In 1997, Spanish emergency services got a call from a tourist that they discovered a lost child. He appeared to be about 14 or 15 years of age, had no identification, and was clearly very traumatized. When police arrived on the scene, they found 22-year-old Frederick, except, well, they didn't know that yet. What they saw was a person who appeared like they could be a teen, who was wearing oversized clothing and had a hat pulled down over his eyes. 
since the person did not have any identification on them, the person was brought to the police station to be asked some questions. But to Frederick's advantage, the police did not want to re-traumatize the child to gain information. He said very little, knowing that the police would not force him to give any answers. Getting nowhere, the authorities brought Frederick to a youth facility, which was exactly what he wanted to begin with. It was at the juvenile facility where Frederick continued to weave his web of lies. He claimed he was from the United States, but refused to give any information on who he was or where he was from. He would tell authorities that he would prefer to call his family when he was ready, and that gained him what he needed, time. He used this to start calling various police departments in the United States posing as a Spanish police officer. He claimed that he had a child in custody from the United States, but they could not determine for sure who he was. Frederick was directed to contact the Organization for Missing and Exploited Children out of the state of Virginia. He told the agency the same story that he did the police and was hoping to get multiple options of identities that he could pose as. But after he started to worry that he was taking too long to find an identity, he immediately informed the American Embassy in Spain and the Missing and Exploited Children organization that he was Nicholas Barclay even before he saw a picture of him. After seeing a picture of Nicholas, Frederick became worried. Nicholas had sandy blonde hair and blue eyes. Frederick had dark hair and dark eyes. He could dye his hair, but getting colored contacts quickly would be a challenge. His worry only increased when he was told that Nicholas's sister, Carrie, had boarded a flight to Spain to come and get him herself. Panicked, Frederick ran away. He didn't know how he was supposed to act in front of Carrie to have her believe his story. After all, he didn't know anything about Nicholas at all, even if he was right or left-handed. Frederick thought if he ran, he'd be in the clear, but the embassy was able to find him and bring him back. Before he was brought in, Frederick went to a tattoo parlor to replicate Nicholas's three small tattoos. He also put on layers of clothes in hopes to hide his body shape and put on a scarf and hat to further hide his appearance. When Carrie saw him, she ran to him and gave him a big hug. She told him how much she missed him and how he looked like their Uncle Pat because of his nose. Carrie then started to show Frederick family pictures in hopes to jog Nicholas's memory, which was allegedly faulty due to the abuse he suffered. Instead, she gave Frederick everything that he needed to start filling in the blanks. When the two appeared in front of a judge to prove that he was Nicholas, the judge told Frederick to show him five pictures of Nicholas's life and explain what they were about. Due to Carrie's unknown coaching, Frederick easily convinced the judge that he was Nicholas Barclay. The next thing he knew, the American embassy declared that he was a U.S. citizen and gave him an American passport to travel to Texas. Back at home, Nicholas's family was a wreck. They wanted Nicholas to come back home and be okay so badly that they didn't want to ask a lot of questions. After all, Nicholas had been traumatized and it would take him time to heal. They thought that he would open up to them when he was ready. When they all saw Nicholas for the first time, they were surprised to see how much he grew. It amazed them how tall he could grow in only three years. Another thing that they noticed was their American-born son had a hint of a French accent. But none of this mattered in their minds since Nicholas was now home. But not everyone was convinced he was. The FBI wanted to interview Nicholas to get more information on his kidnappers, and they sent Agent Nancy Fisher to speak to him. She was immediately suspicious. Nicholas was blonde, but it appeared that his hair was colored since he was growing in a dark shadow of a beard. He also looked like he aged way too much in only three years. He seemed to be older than the 16-year-old he claimed to be, but reasoned that he must be the real Nicholas since his family accepted him. This is where Nancy heard Nicholas's story. Allegedly, Nicholas was kidnapped by high-ranking military officials of the American, Mexican, and European governments. These people abducted countless children for experiments. Nicholas said he was forced to eat insects and had multiple bones broken by his captors. In one of their experiments, these men injected some sort of solution into his eyes to change their color from blue to brown. They also sexually assaulted him, told him to constantly repeat the phrase, you're not you in Spanish, and beat him if he spoke any English at any time. After seeing that Frederick did appear to have some former physical trauma, Nancy believed this story. 
At this point of our tale, Frederick thought he was home free, but not everyone believed him. When a private investigator saw a story on the news about what Nicholas endured, he didn't buy it. He found the whole blue eyes turning brown a bit too far-fetched. So he decided to hunt down a picture of Nicholas and use the identifying characteristic of his ears to see if Nicholas and Frederick were the same person. The pictures did not match, and the PI brought this information to Nancy. Nancy warned him not to interfere with a federal investigation, but soon she too started to suspect that something here was not quite right. Nancy decided to meet with a forensic interviewer, who noticed something was very off with Nicholas. He said that Nicholas did not have the psychological changes that typically occur when a person speaks about a deeply traumatic event. He also told Nancy that since Nicholas lived in an English-speaking household for years, that there would be no way that he should be speaking with the accent that he had. The interviewer also said that there was no way that this Nicholas was raised in an English-speaking household. So after this conversation, Nancy immediately called Carrie to explain how they knew that there was no way that Nicholas was her brother. She told Carrie that she didn't know who he was yet, but in no way should she take this person into her home. So imagine how shocked Nancy must have been when Carrie and Nicholas arrived at the San Antonio airport. When the FBI arrived, Carrie was getting ready to take her brother home. Not knowing what to do here, Nancy called the U.S. Attorney's Office for assistance. They said to let Carrie take Nicholas home and use this as an opportunity to find out who Nicholas actually was. The FBI went to Nicholas's mother, Beverly, and asked for a DNA sample to compare to the man who was saying he was Nicholas. Now his mother refused to comply, and Carrie told the FBI that they didn't need to prove anything to them. Nicholas was their family. This is when the FBI started to become suspicious of the Barclay family. After all, why wouldn't they want to know for sure if the person in their home was who he said he was? But in a very strange plot twist, Frederick also began to get suspicious about this very same thing too. He started to convince himself that there must be a reason why, and what he settled on was that the Barclay must have killed their own son and they were covering it up. But the FBI didn't stop investigating and finally they were able to get a fingerprint from Nicholas. This single fingerprint was identified by Spanish authorities to belong to 23-year-old Frederick. It was here that the FBI learned that he was wanted by Interpol as a serial identity thief who was constantly trying to pass him off as a child. He had stolen identities from countless people around the world. Frederick was arrested in March of 1998 and was convicted of perjury and obtaining a false passport. He was sentenced to six years in prison. Now, just when you guys think that this bizarre story is done, it isn't. While in jail, Frederick made claims that one night, Beverly confessed to him that it was she and Nicholas's brother Jason that were responsible for his death. The FBI then interviewed Jason and found that he appeared to be apathetic towards his brother's disappearance. He also claimed that he didn't even think Nicholas was even his brother, but he didn't want his mom to know that. A couple days after this interview, Jason passed away from a drug overdose. Authorities opened a homicide investigation concerning Nicholas right after Jason's death, and part of this was Beverly taking a polygraph. She actually took two and passed, so authorities decided to ask her to do it a third time. That time she did not pass, but Beverly claimed that the reason she failed was due to she lied when asked about a question of stealing. It had nothing to do with Nicholas's disappearance. This investigation was closed due to lack of evidence. Frederick ultimately served his time and was returned to France when he got out of his American prison. This is when he decided to assume the identity of another boy missing since 1996, Leo Bailey. DNA testing proved Frederick's lives and then he went back to Spain. Here, he pretended to be a teen named Ruben Sanchez Espanoza. When police discovered the truth, they deported him back to France again. Then in 2005, Frederick started to pose as a 15-year-old Spanish orphan named Francisco Fernandez Fernandez as he attended school in France. He told the school administration that his parents were killed in a car accident. To convince them he was telling the truth, Frederick dressed as a teen. 
He changed his walking style, he covered his receding hairline by constantly wearing a ball cap, and he used hair removal creams on his face to take care of that 5 o'clock shadow. After seeing a television program about Frederick, a school administrator confronted him after they called the police. Frederick was arrested and was soon back in prison for using a false identity. Just like Barbara, Frederick is now out of jail. In 2007, he got married to a French woman, and the two had several children of their own. Ten years later, Frederick made claims that his wife left him for another and abandoned their children, who he was now caring for by himself. At times, he claimed that he would never impersonate anyone ever again, but when asked by a staff writer by the New Yorker magazine if he became a new person, he admitted he isn't. Being a serial impersonator and a pathological liar still appears to be who this man actually is. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. What do you think about the true origin story behind the movie The Orphan? Let us know on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on X at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Great Molasses Flood. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really should check out our store. You'll find some amazing items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional episodes, and much, much more, join our fan club on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifying history to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time.